Fathers for Justice were a nightmare. They locked me in, in our house in Devon. They, they padlocked it, you see. Did you have any sympathy for their, their cause? Not much. I invited her to come in, she was seven or eight. And I said, I have to apologize to you. I shouldn't ever have sent you back to mum. And she ran round and hugged me and said, does this mean I'll never have to see mummy again? I was almost in tears. The whole consequences of Brexit, the way in which Theresa May was treated in Parliament, the way that Boris Johnson ran the country, the way that Liz Truss nearly brought us to the brink. If I was a young person, just able to vote, I think I'd hesitate to do it. This is The Judges, Power, Politics and the People, hosted by the University of Law. This week, I'm speaking with Baroness Butler Sloss. Elizabeth Butler Sloss became the first woman to head a High Court division when she was appointed President of the Family Division in 1999. She came into the public eye when, as a High Court judge, she was chosen to chair the Cleveland Child Abuse Inquiry in the late 1980s, where she was instrumental in focusing on the voice of the child. That focus led to the central principle of the Children Act in 1989, namely that the interests of the child are paramount. In 1988, she was promoted to the Court of Appeal, the first woman to reach that level of the judiciary. Known for her common sense and pragmatism, Lady Butler Sloss presided over several key family law cases, including ruling that gay couples could adopt children. Since retiring from the bench in 2005, she has been an active crossbencher in the House of Lords, speaking on measures such as divorce reform, anti-slavery and trafficking measures, and assisted suicide. I began by asking Lady Butler Sloss what it had been like being the only woman at the top of the judiciary. Well, I kept my head down. <laughs> I was very lucky. I had three elder brothers. So I was very used to being in the company of men. And I took the view, unlike uh, Brenda Hale and uh, Mary Arden, that my job was to make sure others would follow me. So I kept very quiet, let them get on with it. And only when they absolutely went too far, I would say, come off it, chap. So they'd all roll with laughter. <laughs> you didn't want to rock the boat. I absolutely did. And Brenda was horrified with me <laughs> because she thought I should have been standing up, you know, as the woman in the Court of Appeal. My view was I should be staying very quiet. Did she expect you to take more of a sort of feminist stance and to, uh, in, in judgments? Or, no, no or, yes, I think so, probably, because she did in some of hers. But if I could give you an anecdote, when I arrived, I went to see the then Master of the Rolls, Lord Donaldson, and it was fairly obvious he wasn't madly keen to have me. We later became close friends. And I said to him rather diffidently, uh, are you expecting me to record Lord Justice? And he looked at me very coldly and said, my wife is Lord Mayor of London. <laughs> So, I, so in other words, yes. Other words, yes. yes. <laughs> and I must tell you the sequel. When Tom Bingham became uh, Master of the Rolls, I went to him and said, isn't it time, I was being pushed by Brenda, as you might imagine, to stop being called Lord Justice. And he said, yes, I agree. He had to get, oh, it was terribly funny, Derry Irving's approval. And eventually I sat on one side of him and another judge on the other in the Court of Appeal when Lord Bingham said... Um, they, Lord Justice Butler Sloss will from today be called Lady Justice. Up got the bar bowed and we got on with the case. The sequel was from your newspaper, which had a headline, same se uh, se sex change judge. <laughs> <laughs> well, it took a while, didn't it? And before that, uh, you'd been in the High Court. So you were Mr. Justice Butler Sloss, were you, in the High Court? No, I was allowed to be oh, Mrs. You were Justice. You were allowed to be Mrs. Justice. Yes. 
It was only when it, it was only when you got to the the Court of Appeal that it became a, an Absolutely. issue. Absolutely, it was too yes. funny. Yes, and were you when you were in the Court of Appeal? Were you aware then of the influence that you could have or the impact you might have, being the sole female voice? Yes, I thought I was just the um, forerunner of um, many women being in the Court of Appeal. And, so and indeed I, you were. As indeed I was, and now nobody thinks about it. Let's go back then to your, to your early life and where you grew up and so on, where you went to school. I think you went to school in London, didn't you? Uh, in Kew. Well, in Kew. I went to what my mother called a dame school and uh, until I was 12. Then I went to Wickham Abbey. Uh, then I um, went to Lausanne University for a year. You didn't go to university, did because, you? Because, well, I tried for uh, Newnham when I was 16, and I was a bit young, and they didn't want me. And then when I came back after a um, marvellous year in Lausanne, at Lausanne University as an external student, um, my mother was extremely ill with multiple sclerosis and had retired to bed, poor dear. And um, my brothers had left home. My father had just become a high court judge and away on circuit. So he said, would I live at home? We had my nanny as housekeeper. So, I, I, and I couldn't cook anyway. <laughs> but um, I needed to order the food and just to be there. My brothers, who'd all been at Cambridge, would not allow me to go to a red brick university. <laughs> so there was family influence. But, and also- So I just did, I just went to the Inns of Court School of Law. Yes. I mean, was it a given that you would go into law, given that you came from quite a legal background? No, it wasn't. I had the three elder brothers, two went into business, one became Attorney General and then Lord Chancellor. So he went into the law. He was horrified when I wanted to be a barrister. But my father, who was very um, unusually uh, thoughtful about the rights of women, said if the, uh, his sons wanted to do it, why shouldn't his daughter? And, and why your brother, Michael, who became Lord Havers, but why was he horrified? Well, he said I was only doing it to get find a husband. <laughs> but I did find a husband. <laughs> <laughs> because your husband was a barrister. Yes. <laughs> yes, indeed. So you, you went to the bar and did you enjoy it? I loved it. But, but it wasn't long after, was it, that you actually stood for a parliamentary seat for I the did. Conservatives? Yes. So I suppose it had you won that seat... Which, which you didn't. Um, and no chance. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you were tempted into politics. Very much so. But I was nine months pregnant on polling day. Oh. <laughs> and my daughter was born a fortnight later. I, sa I sat back and thought, I'm very, um, very much in love with my husband. I had a new baby. I loved my career at the bar and I intended to carry on. How on earth could I do politics? So it was, a, it was a passing whim, if you like. Yes, I, I gave that up. You've Terri always been interested in politics. But... Very much so. And indeed, Charlie Faulkner said I was the most um, political of all the heads of division. <laughs> <laughs> yes, because you retain, you take, retain a strong interest in politics. Very much so. And, and we'll come back to what you do now. But um, so you, 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 you then continued your career at the bar, but attempting to bring up three children. How was that? And how easy was it or not? Parts of it were easy, parts were difficult. We had a series of nannies. Some were very good indeed. One is a close personal friend now, um, after many years. Um, but I then had one who wasn't very good. Um, I used, because I was in chambers in the temple, because we had our flat in the temple, which we had soon after we were married, very lucky, I could leave chambers usually at five, go home, watch the Wombles with the children, and um, see them to bed, because the nannies were day nannies. And then as long as Joe was at home, my husband, I would go back to chambers or I would work after dinner. Hard work? Yes, oh yes. But I think women rather expect to be multifaceted. I mean, most men I know only can do one thing at a time, but most women do ev everything at one time. <laughs> they have to. They have to. So, so you managed that and you, your career began to progress and you did go right from the beginning into family law, did you? I spent um, about six to nine months in Christmas Humphreys Chambers, who was one of the leading um, criminal lawyers. Um, because my brother Mike, who came round very quickly, 
um, to appreciating I really did want to be a barrister and was serious. And he got me a pupillage in his chambers that he was in. Right. And then my father's golfing partner <laughs> took me as a pupil because in those days there wasn't any work for the young bar and they were glad to get the fees. And now um, pupils are paid. In my day, we paid the pupil master. Yes, very different days. But you then decided to, you had to have means really in those days, didn't you? It was very difficult unless either you, I mean... I mean, you inns, do now, I think, but I think yeah. you... Well, uh, nowadays, the inns have valuable scholarships. Some of them very valuable, so 25,000. Uh, none of that in my day. I mean, there were 64 women and 2,000 men when I was called. So you really did stood, stand out, didn't you? It was difficult. It was yeah. difficult for women, And there I wasn't think. any work. But such work as there was, apart from the criminal bar, such work as there was, they wouldn't give it to women. Did you feel yourself pushed into the family work? or did No, you... I, I did actually want to do it. I, I, you know, my father chose a pupilage for me in family because in those days, nobody, no woman went into commercial or civil work. No. And then you, you made quite an unusual decision to become a registrar. Yeah. Tell me about that. Well, that was interesting. Um, I got asked at the age of 36... So it was quite funny because the then president had been head of my chambers, was godfather to one of my children. And when I went to see him, he said, would I become a, a registrar? Because he wanted a married woman with children. And I was the first woman, which is actually the proudest thing I did, was the first woman in the country to become a, now a district judge. And uh, I said, the trouble is, uh, President, I'm only 36. Oh, dear, he said, I told the Lord Chancellor you were 46. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I went home. He said, I, I still, I'd check with him, but I would like to have you. I went home and asked my husband, and he said, do what you think is best. I then consulted my father, who had just retired as a high court judge, and he said, you must take it. And I said, why? He said, you're quite simply neglecting your children. You've now got a practice that's taking you all around the country. I did a lot of inquiry work, yes. as well as family. And um, he said, you, you really don't have a very good nanny. <laughs> and you must take it. This is how these decisions are made. Yes. So, because this was going to be more regular hours and it was going to be yes. in London. I would be home by five, probably half past four. And I suddenly realized it because then I said to my daughter, aged 11, um, I'm now going to become a registrar and I'll be in London. Oh, mum, she said, does that mean we'll know where you are? Oh. So I suddenly realized how right my father was. Yes, indeed. And then, of course, thereafter, you went up the judicial uh, yes, and ladder. And I'm the only person who's gone from um, being a district judge to a high court judge, even today. Yes, it's, it's, and it, of course it gave you a grounding. For, you'd been on the cold face, as it were. Absolutely. So then when you went right to the top. And I'd like to move now in a swift leap to your time as president of the family division um, and the first woman to reach, and actually still the only one, I think, who's been ahead of, uh, of a division. That's right. Division. Well, apart from the president of the Supreme Court. Exactly, but uh, head of a high court division. What was that like? I mean, that's quite an onerous responsibility. Yes, I mean, I wanted to sit in court, and I was lucky to sit more than three days a week. Um, it, there was a large amount of admin, and I found my most difficult time was working with the government departments, because I had to work with the Lord Chancellor's Department, now the Ministry of Justice, but I also had to work with the Department of Health in those days, did... Um, looked after social workers. So you, you, you had quite a lot of dealings with ministers. Was that on budgetary matters or what was that to do with? Legislation very often. Oh, uh, with the Ministry of Justice, the Lord Chancellor's Department, it was getting judges and organising how the judges sat, what the family judges did. And I remember going to the then Lord Chancellor, uh, I think still Derry, and um, saying that they were taking three months to appoint a judge to do um, specialist family work, like adoption, I could do it in under a week, probably two days. And could I take it over? And, um, and what did he say? And he thought about it and agreed. I mean, his department was delighted. And um, we did. We turned it round in under a week. My department increased enormously in size <laughs> from 2 to 10 eventually. 
Yes. But so, uh, we took over more and more work. And Derry Irving at one stage said to me, you're taking all my family work from me. <laughs> did, well, did you find them receptive? I mean, who held the balance of power at that time between the, the ministers and the judges? I mean, did, did you feel you had to go and sort of with a begging bowl for what you wanted no. or did well, they listen? I, first of all, I decided that if it was the Secretary of State or the Lord Chancellor, I went to them. If it was anybody junior, like a minister of state, they came to me. <laughs> <laughs> right, so that's how it worked out, with the balance of it. Um, and of course, in your time as president, as well as all the admin side of it and organising of judges to sit on cases, you had to deal with quite a turbulent time in the shape of fathers becoming very vociferous who'd been denied access to their children, oh, didn't you? Fathers for Justice were a nightmare. Yes, absolutely. I absolutely. mean, they locked me in, in our house in Devon. They locked the only gate that uh, was the exit from our farm. <laughs> you literally were um, besieged there, weren't you? Yes. So, I mean, they, they padlocked it, you see. Fortunately, they didn't know, but we had these bolt cutters. And Joe was still in bed when I went off to something or other very early. So I rushed back, said, come with your bolt cutters and so I could get out of the main gate. <laughs> so it was just you and your husband in the house at that time yes. when that happened. And it must have been quite frightening. No, I wasn't frightened. Um, the police did then come and um, put it, told me to install a lot more outside lights and so on. I, well, the interesting thing was the death threats. That's other, I mean, my brother, Mike, as Attorney General, had regular death threats from the IRA who blew up his flat in Wimbledon. Mm. But uh, my death threats, twice, were from dissatisfied fathers. Yes. They, they were very, very vociferous at that time. There were protests all over the place, all over the country. Judges, family judges were, were, were targets, weren't they? Yeah, it was for a quite lot of... funny because I was in The Hague one morning about to catch a flight back to London. I'd been at a conference and I heard that they were going to be taking a, a tank down Fleet Street. And they hadn't got it together until, and from my room in the law courts, I looked across and I could see this miniature tank <laughs> going down Fleet Street. And then they climbed on the roof of the, um, the law courts, dressed as Robin and whatever else. That's right, Batman. Batman. <laughs> I remember. <laughs> I do. And, and how, what, what did you feel about them at that time? Did you have any sympathy for their, their cause? Not much, because they weren't really targeting the main problems. And they were silly, because we had a conference once, I forget now where it was, but it happened to be on a canal. And they got a, came across the canal and threw canisters into the win, through the window. What they didn't realize was I'd invited another father's organization to come and talk to us about the problems of fathers. And they stopped that very father's um, speech. Mm, mm. And I actually found for fathers fairly regularly whenever I could, um, um, because if a father was better than the mother, he should have the children. But generally, the mother in those days had the children. The children were settled with the mother. And unless the father was going to be a full-time father and had been uh, better than mother, why move them? Well, I think and that, that was the problem. That was the problem. And one of the things at that time was that they they didn't know what was going on. Because I, I, I don't know how much better they feel it is now, but it is it is more open. And it was the courts were attacked at that time for. But being, they were entitled to be there. They could be there. That's absolutely right. And you're quite right. It has but become very much more open. And my successor, Andrew McFarlane, who is excellent. And he is looking at, I think, opening the courts to a much greater extent. Do, do, looking back, I mean, do you think it, it was uh, the courts were too secretive in those days? The family courts I'm talking about. Well, I think we just followed the tradition. I think we should have opened up much earlier. Um, I certainly would give as many judgments as I could in open court. But one of the problems was um, the press. Not so much the press in court, but the press printing names and places, and even the local authority could identify very often where a family was. Still quite a contentious issue, isn't it? How much can be um, printed and published and, and protect the children meanwhile? It's generally the children. I mean, I'm not too bothered about the parents, but the children really are entitled to be protected. 
Uh, and looking back at your time there, what do you think your greatest achievement was in terms of, of rulings, taking your rulings together that you made on behalf of children, families? I mean, what was your main aim and, and what do you think you actually did achieve? I tried some cases that mattered. Um, as an example, I, tried, I gave anonymity to the Bulger killers. And that was a very easy decision to make because there were vigilantes out there talking about killing them. So, you know, the rights, you know, uh, under the Human Rights Act, it was pretty obvious. But the press, you know, fought against it. Um, I think I opened up the courts. I arranged for only those with some specialised knowledge to try adoption cases. I used to um, see the parents who succeeded in an adoption, usually in my room afterwards, and I had a dog, a Labrador in those days, which was lovely for the children. And very often an older child would come with the adopted child. And on one occasion, I was, got a lovely invitation to an adoption party with a photograph of me, the child and the dog. <laughs> I didn't go, but it was a very nice invitation. You very much were at the forefront of the whole movement for putting the child first, which ultimately led to the legislation we have, the Children Act and so on, weren't you? Yes. That was very much at the heart of your philosophy. Yeah. Well, I said the child is not a package, he's a person. <laughs> I, did, one of the, I remember one uh, controversial ruling, but and, and quite forward-thinking, really, when you ruled that... Um, uh, a, a child could be adopted by a gay couple. Yes. And that was all over the front pages. Um, I'd done a little research, and in the States, they looked at 30 families of gay men, and they discovered that after about 30 years, of all the children who'd been brought up by the gay couple, only one was gay. Because was that people's concern that if they were brought up by oh, a gay couple, they, they, would, they would then would, be gay they themselves? Would, you know that they, they saw gay men as paedophiles, basically. And I could see no reason if a welfare officer, Kafkas, eventually, you know, the child welfare service, said that the um, the man, you couldn't, I couldn't adopt to both of them. But there was no reason not to adopt to a man if he had a man as a partner. I couldn't see anything wrong with it. Yeah, it was quite an outcry, I think, in some oh, of yes. the tabloids. Well, oh, yes. Well, did, that, did that make you think, have I done the right thing? Oh, I had a fair number of outcries, the tabloids, <laughs> over my year. No, I wasn't bothered by that at all. Did you, did you ever have regrets or, or think to yourself, have I made the right decision here? My father gave me extraordinarily good advice, two bits of advice. One was, you've got too high a voice, <laughs> bring it down. <laughs> And the other was, um, speak more slowly. That would be very helpful. But um, yes, I, I, I did have regrets. I mean, there was one case where the psychiatrist um, told me that this very nice young mother who'd had a terrible um, boyfriend uh, should keep the child. And then she got another boyfriend and had a child by it. And she was a lovely girl. And this dear little girl aged about five six. And about six months later, the social worker had kept her, and I, a very good social worker, got in touch with this child psychiatrist and said, I'm not very happy about this child. She's being um, victimized. Uh, the mother is not pleased with the fact she was great, that she wasn't grateful to go back. And she's now got another child. So the psychiatrist arranged with the mother to go at about 12 and turned up at 8 in the morning, finding the little girl was doing the washing up. The mother said she hadn't done something right so she mm. wouldn't get her lunch. Mm. So the other child was having her lunch and this girl wasn't to go to school. So the psychiatrist said, I'll take her to school and took her off uh, and went straight to social services and said, look, she shouldn't be with this family. Mm. And so we, child came back, and I said, bring her with you. And I invited her to come in. She was seven or eight. And I said, I have to apologize to you. I shouldn't ever have sent you back to mum. And the wonderful single woman who had brought her up to, for about three years was still able to take her. 
Oh, that was, that was marvellous. And she went back and I said, now you're going to whoever she called Auntie So-and-so. And she ran round and hugged me and said, does this mean I'll never have to see Mummy again? Oh, goodness. I was almost in tears. Of course, yes. They're heart-rending cases heart -rending. that you but have you to know, deal with. But you know, I'd made a mistake. Yes. So the psychiatrist had yes. made the mistake. Yes. And the social worker. Yes. How very, very heartbreaking. Yes. Uh, and you must have... Did you ever lie awake at night with some of these cases? No, because my father's other advice was at any level up to the Supreme <laughs> Court, you can always be reversed, so don't worry. <laughs> I mean, very practical. Most, very, most judges are horrified at being reversed. I was just because of my father. Well, that's life. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask you a little bit about the uh, one or two of the inquiries? You, you've chaired various inquiries. Uh, first of all, the Cleveland child abuse inquiry, and I think, in a way, that you made your name with that one. Would that be fair? Yes, I think that's how I got to the court of appeal. Probably. <laughs> was it how difficult an inquiry was that one? Well, it was emotionally very traumatic. There were a third of children who should never have been, well, a third of children who clearly had been abused. There was a third of children who pretty clearly had not been abused. And in the middle was this group of children who might have been. But because they were removed so quickly, um, the evidence was all completely distorted and contaminated. And so all these children had to go home. Mm -hmm. Yes, it had, had great and impact. And so you, had, had, you had administrative impact. abuse as well as the sexual abuse. Hmm. Much later on, you mm -hmm. were, and presumably partly because of that, you were appointed to look into the, I call it the Westminster sex abuse inquiry following the allegations later found to be completely false mm. by the person at that time known as Nick and involving various high-profile high, uh, high politicians. Um, <coughs> you stepped down from that after not very long. I had domestic reasons, which were overwhelming. And I just realized that um, having discussed it with my children, I, I actually couldn't carry on. Do you mean family commitments or? Uh... Family, domestic problems. You don't want to elaborate on no. that? You were also criticised, I think, or some people found it, found it a, a, a cause for criticism that you were affiliated, as they thought, to the Conservative Party through relatives or previous background. Was that, was that another reason you stepped No. I mean, I'd never been the least bit bothered by the fact I had a Conservative family and I had carried on with that w without any problem. And prior to that, of course, you, you not an inquiry, but you were given the um, rather onerous task of sitting on the inquest of um, the late Princess of Wales and Dodie Alfired. Yes. Um, again, that was another one you stepped down from after not too long. Tell me about that. Well, I actually did several months on it and went to Paris several times and I had it prepared for my successor. I got, I was very reluctant to do it. And I was persuaded by Charlie Faulkner when he was Lord Chancellor. And I said, I can't possibly do it if there's an, an, a jury, because I didn't have that experience. I had tried very few criminal cases, and I just couldn't deal with the jury. <clears throat> anyway, I was over-persuaded. You know, it was my duty, so I took it. And then um, they asked for a jury, and I refused. And they went to the divisional court who said there should be a jury. And they were absolutely right. Of course there should be. And so I didn't know what to do. So I went to see the then Lord Chief and said, what on earth do I do? He said, I've been waiting for you to stand down. <laughs> he said, of course you can't do it. He realised once that decision had been made yes. that you, it was not going to be appropriate or no, you didn't have the experience. I didn't have the experience. And they were, um, Al Fayed was making through his lawyers every possible difficulty. And it would be very unwise for me to try and cope with the lawyers and cope with um, the jury. So as soon as the then Lord Chief um, advised me to retire, uh, he said, I've already got somebody in place. Lord Justice Scott Baker did it absolutely brilliantly. But I had prepared it for him. I expect it was a relief, was it? Huge relief. <laughs> I mean, I didn't want to do it in the first place. Why? Well, I didn't think it was my scene, basically. 
Um, I knew quite a bit about coroners. I'd had a lot to do with um, advising that they should have a chief coroner and so on. I forget why, but I was involved in some case where this came up. And um, I just didn't think I was the appropriate person for it. I think Charlie was, um, Charlie Faulkner was um, casting around to find someone <laughs> who was prepared to do it. <laughs> and then you, you also did chaired security. I was chairman of the Security Commission. Uh, and I did, with, as co-chair, two um, MI5 and MI6 inquiries. And then as the sole chair, I was asked to chair, um, look at the security of the royal palaces because there'd been the journalist who had stood on the, um, the balcony uh, showing and they hadn't checked him. He had a bogus reference. And they absolutely didn't think of looking on the web to see if he'd got a website, oh. which of course he had. And so I went, having worked out with my team and talked to the private secretaries of the Queen and the private secretary of Prince Charles, we came to the conclusion that th this is public knowledge, um, that the very obvious thing was to have a director of security who should have sufficient status and sufficient clout to be able to tell the private secretary and the uh, Lord Chamberlain, this has to be done. So you, you, that was the, the result of your inquiry? That was your recommendation? Yes, and so, uh, but I went to see the Queen and I went to see Prince Charles. Were they concerned about lack of security? I don't think either of them had really appreciated that they didn't have the security. <laughs> and that was the problem. They all thought the police was looking after them. Was and this what, before the man who, who got it, Fagan, who got it? It was the, after. Right. But anyway, <laughs> the, um, <laughs> the, they, uh, the Queen, who was the person who mattered, obviously, um, she accepted entirely the um, recommendation of my commission. Uh, and as a result, um, they now have, I think, a director of security at Buckingham Palace who is responsible for all the royal households and checking on the security. I mean, they weren't checking the security of the men bringing in the goods through the lorries. It seems astonishing, doesn't it? Doesn't it? They thought the police were doing it all. You're practicing Anglican, and, and I wondered how much um, your faith had influenced your decisions and generally your work as a judge. The then Archbishop of York once asked me that, and I absolutely didn't know, you know, how had my um, faith uh, influenced my decisions? Because he clearly didn't like some of them. <laughs> and, um, Perhaps I, he was thinking I, of gay adoption. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. Yes, it might have been. Um, anyway, I, it didn't do it, um, obviously, but I think it affected my moral stance, my feeling that I had to do the right thing. But I don't think I ever made a decision because I was an Anglican. But I think my Anglican faith, you know, which has been all my life, um, just is behind telling me, to do the right thing. I don't have the sort of communion with God that some people have. I wish I did, but uh, uh, you know, I just know that things I must do and things I must not do. I suppose it's more now that you're in the House of Lords and you have a role in legislation and on things like assisted suicide. I suppose it might come to bear there, mightn't it? Yes, it does, very much. I mean, one of my major reasons for not wanting um, assisted suicide, thank goodness you aren't calling it assisted dying, <laughs> uh, because uh, Elora Finlay, who is a great protagonist on this, she's, you know, a professor of palliative care. Yes. And... Um, Behind it, of course, that's my major reason. But I've got other very good reasons for objecting to it. I had a nanny who was in, we, my brothers and I paid for her to go to a nice care home. And each time, I was very happy there. And each time I saw her, she'd say, I shouldn't be alive. I'm wasting all your money. And if she'd been given the chance, I'm sure she would have um, accepted. She felt she was a burden. Yes, she felt she was a burden. But when I wasn't there, she forgot that and was, you know, quite yes. content. Do you think eventually, I mean, it comes up repeatedly, doesn't it? It's about to come up again, and almost And what certainly. do you think it'll go through in some yes, shape or form? Do you? But the current proposals are 
absolutely unrealistic. How can you say six months? If you get motor neurone disease or one of the other locked in diseases, if we can have it, they should be allowed it much earlier. If you're saying if it's going to happen at all, it, yes, it, it's it, got it, to six, happen. It shouldn't be a six month yes. only left to live yeah. uh, criteria. Because how can you tell apart from the else? Yeah, and also, that is um, really unkind because if you have it there in the future, you're going to have possibly a year or two years to suffer before you get to the point when you can ask for it. But what worries me is there are two sorts of doctors the doctors who agree with it, the doctors who don't. If the doctors who agree with it may find it too easy. And the other thing that worries me is if you're in a state of depression, which is an actual physical... Um, a medical condition, isn't medical, it? Well, yeah, medical condition. While you're in that state, um, you're much more likely to say you want that to happen than when you come out of it. You'll be speaking against. I shall speak against. But you do think this time there is there is a likelihood oh, of it going through? Yes, because the BMA have yes. changed their stance. They and, have. And I'm not sure what the medical colleges are saying. Mm. They've kept rather quiet. Mm. Mm. So yes, no, I'd be I very don't... surprised if it doesn't go through in the next five years. Currently, the government doesn't want to know about it. If you, if you were to pick one of your cases as the most difficult one you had to sit on, would, what would it be, the most difficult decision? I had two um, mad cow disease case children, boy and girl, different places, both um, excellent athletes, both at the start of their A-levels, aged 16, I think. Both of them got mad cow disease. And the parents wanted them to have some innovative treatment that was not accepted in England. And there was a professor of pathology in Tokyo. And in those days, we had even got to the point of having video recordings, and he was speaking live to us from Tokyo. And he'd got this idea, uh, and he tried it out on mice and so on, and it had worked, and it had prolonged their lives. And both families asked me to do it. Three doctors came, English doctors came, to say that this wasn't approved in England, it was not appropriate to do, and so on. And the third doctor, I said to him, if your child was in this position, would you take this drug? He said, yes. Good question. So I, gave, I allowed both families to have this drug. Yes. And because, of course, the English medical people all said you can't take it. Very difficult. And uh, one child died before she could take it, but the boy in Belfast lived, on, I think, another three or four years. I'm not sure how much he improved, but certainly a certain amount. Well, we've had a sequence of similar cases, haven't we, in recent years? This is after your time, but there's the same kind of issue um, where, where, where children have come before the courts and the parents have been at odds with the medical profession. Oh, I did half, I did a dozen of those. And they're very, there must be uh, almost impossible cases. Well, they're not generally very difficult to try, except in the emotions that you have in court. Because if the doctors say, really, nothing better can be done. Would you tend to take in those cases the view of the medical profession? If it's coherent, if it's agreed by everybody and they've had an independent consultant from outside the hospital, and generally they bring two. It's just that with, for the parents, they want the very last chance, don't oh, they, to go and they abroad? they want to go to the States or exactly. they want to go to Australia or they want to go somewhere. Yes. Yes. And it's difficult. I mean, judges sitting on those cases have come in for quite a bit of abuse. Yeah. It's, it's hard for them. I suppose the other one... Did you ever read The Children Act by yes, Ian McEwan? I did. Well, I saw the film as well. <laughs> ah, I haven't seen the film. I don't know I want to. But I, um, Alan Ward, I think, filled Ian McEwan up with, the, with this. And I think he took me as his model, uh, except my private life was not like the private life of the <laughs> Ian McEwan book. I have a very happy <laughs> private life. I'm married for 64 years. But... Um, the story of going to see a young person in hospital, generally Jehovah Witnesses. And one particular, um, Robert Johnson had more of them than I did. 
But I did go on one occasion to see a young, basically a young man, he was 16 or 17, who didn't want to have the blood transfusion. And he said, why are you giving it to me? He said, when I'm 18, I won't take it. And I said, when you're under 18, you're in my care, and I must keep you alive. What happened when he reached 18? I don't know. I'm sure he died. Mm. But there are others whose parents don't want them to take it. They'd rather they died than interfere with their religion. And in those cases, yes. would you overrule their religious beliefs? Oh, absolutely. Mm. Because the welfare of the child is paramount, and your religious beliefs. I mean, one of a very fine judgment by um, John Laws uh, on the registrar who wouldn't marry a gay couple. Um, oh, oh, I think it was a um, same-sex marriage. And um, John Laws said, um, a, a very strong Anglican, you know, the, the, this is um, his duty, is not to his religion, but to the job he's got. And if he doesn't like um, doing that, he must give up that job and take another. Yes. John, um, George Carey, former archbishop, said it would be nice if they'd had a Christian at the head of this court. But he was a Christian. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he didn't agree, I don't think, with that judgment, No, he, he was horrified. He was but horrified. It would have been a good <laughs> idea if he'd noticed that John Laws was a regular attender at the Temple Church. But he, he put the law first and the interests of the child first. Of that course. was it. Yeah. Um, looking globally now, or not globally, looking back at the um, state of the family courts, do you think they're now in pretty good shape or not really? We still have horrendous delays and children who should be taken into care wait months and months and months for their cases to come before the courts. Also, I think there are children being taken into care who shouldn't be because we aren't in... No, I don't think they're in good shape. I think Andrew McFarlane has an appalling job. My job was, I took the view, my job was the second most difficult after the Lord Chief. But I think his job is absolutely impossible because they have the government of the day, whether it was particularly from um, David Cameron, but even before, the Ministry of Justice has never been seen as a department that should be given a lot of money. And whenever you're going to cut uh, the budget, you cut the Ministry of Justice first. And, and then within the that, probably family courts, do you think they get a raw deal? <laughs> they're getting a raw deal, but they're not getting a raw deal than anyone else. The criminal courts are getting a raw deal. But um, the prisons are getting a raw they deal are. everywhere. But the austerity of um, George Osborne has borne the most appalling fruit. Uh, and the family courts are the worst sufferers because we, it's the children. And the children matter more than anyone else. So the children are still be the, the victims of, of the delays, the lack of funding. Is that still a massive problem uh, oh, I for think the family so. courts? I mean, I'm out of date uh, for many, many years. But as far as what I can see from the press and what I occasionally hear from the judges, um, yes, I mean, there are appalling delays. But also it means that they haven't got enough welfare officers, I don't think. Uh, they, social workers are not going quickly enough to families because they're only dealing with the families where it's gone wrong and there are no shortage of families that social workers should be looking at to stop it going wrong. Another area where you, you've been active in reform is, is, is divorce, isn't it? I mean, you've been, particularly since in recent years when you've been in the House of Lords, is that another area where we have failings? Well, now I think it's hugely improved. Um, I was working with Exeter University, a marvellous professor there, on the current Finance Act, uh, current Divorce Act. And um, it's great. Uh, and I think the new law is very sensible. The problem is, at the moment, the financial provision. And we desperately need Parliament to look at the financial provision. Yes. I mean, the, the government went some way, didn't they, uh, after a bit of a campaign. The Times was involved. You were very much involved. And blame has gone out of the window yes, a bit. Yes, completely. But as you say, there's still this uh, difficulty about dividing assets. Yeah. Uh, you may know the Law Commission's looking at it. I do, yes. And Which is great. And so I, I, they actually came to see me, several members of the Law Commission, to discuss it with me. And I gave them my own rather individual views. <laughs> Well, what would you like to see? What is the main thing that needs to be done on divorce as far as dividing assets is concerned? Well, for 95% of people, it's not very much in the way of assets. It's mainly the house 
and there may be a bit of money, is very often the debts. Uh, but for the 5% rich people that people like Fiona Shackleton uh, deal with um, and Nicholas Mostyn when he was at the bar, they, um, I don't like this more or less equal distribution. I'm not sure it really reflects a, a marriage. I'm a bit old fashioned. I remember Lord Justice Ormerod who talked about, um, you know, what was necessary. And what was necessary, if there's money, should be very generous. But I don't see it as 50%. Because if a man is going to make a huge amount of money, the fact that his wife, I mean, this is terribly old fashioned, but the fact that his wife has been at home and looked after the children entitles her to a great deal of money. But if he's a multimillionaire, a billionaire, I don't see that it entitles her to 50%. Well, it's very difficult to, to divide it, isn't it? And of course, he wouldn't be able to, the argument, as you know, he wouldn't be able to make that money were she not at home looking after the family. Yes. Um, she could have gone out to work if she'd wanted to by employing nannies and, you know, that sort of thing. Yes, I, I see the contrary argument, but I don't think it takes it to the figure that um, those who come and are resident here for 12 months in order to be entitled to seek, um, you know, matrimonial financial relief yes. should necessarily be quite so high. Do, do you think marriage has fallen out of fashion somewhat? Yes, or? I think it has, and I find that sad. Um, one of the most interesting things I think, next, I think marriage still remains the most stable of relationships. And the second most stable, I suspect, will be um, civil partnerships. Because I think when people commit themselves, going through whatever registration it may be, it does actually matter. And it matters to the children. So we've, we've got marriage falling out of fashion. There's also a disenchantment with politics generally, isn't there? Politics is close to your heart and people may be disinclined to vote. What do you feel about that? Well, I think that the public have got a very good reason to be very disenchanted. Uh, the, what's been going on in the last five years, four or five years, has been very depressing. The whole consequences of Brexit, the way in which Theresa May was treated in Parliament, the way that Boris Johnson ran the country, the way that Liz Truss nearly brought us to the brink. Uh, if I was a young person just able to vote, I think I'd hesitate to do it. But I do think young people need to look at the fact that they are the future. If they don't play a part by voting and taking an interest in what's going on, they'll have a much worse future than if they actually try to do something about it. Yes. How much do you think recent events, recent, recent events under the uh, latest administrations has, has, has put the rule of law and generally our, our democratic system, it's brought it into disrepute somewhat, has it? I'm Would not sure it has. Um, I think, the, well, I don't know, but I hope the public think the rule of law is still uh, up front. Um, I think the spat between the judiciary uh, and the um, executive has been sad. But the idea, as government likes to put it, that there is some sort of fight between the judiciary and the executive or parliament's madness. They, we make the laws, the judiciary carry them out. If they carry them out in a way that um, parliament or particularly executive doesn't like, they can change the law. So but my real worry is the fact that parliament is being sidelined by the executive more and more, particularly in the last five years, by passing laws which, for some reason, the House of Commons is accepting, which give the right to government to make decisions based on primary legislation and changing primary legislation by regulation. And you can't really fight regulation. Regulations, you, the whole of it is either comes in or doesn't, and there is a um, practice, a sort of protocol, that we don't actually um, vote against regulations. So you're talking about the whole legislative process, that far too much is left now to secondary legislation or to... Yeah, to, absolutely. Uh, instead of going before the, the yeah. 
full, full debate before both houses. You have to look at the EU legislation. The, thank goodness, um, Northern Ireland Protocol um, failed, but it was an appalling piece. The um, Nationality and Borders Act, the Illegal Migration Act, all have what are called Henry VIII clauses. That's to say a clause that says secondary legislation can change primary legislation without proper input from Parliament. And what I can't understand is why the House of Commons isn't up fighting about it. We're fighting it in the Lords, but then is they it, take it, no notice. Do you know that most amendments in the Lords go, if there's half a dozen amendments or sometimes 20, an hour only is allocated in the Commons to look at the Lords' amendments? Well, is this, is this an offshoot of this particular government or, you know, the last 10 years in government of the Conservatives, that this has all happened much more, well, hasn't much it? more. But I don't think a Labour opposition will oppose too much because if they get to power, they can do the same thing. They have been, in the Lords, surprisingly supportive of the crossbenchers and a lot of Conservative peers who are very, very unhappy about what's going on. But when it gets to the Commons, they have an hour to deal with our amendments. So looking at the, looking at the power balance between Parliament, the judiciary and the executive, the judiciary is still doing its bit. And, and, and applying the law as, it, as it's made. But between the executive and parliament, you're saying the executive is really uh, in the upper, has the upper hand when yes. it should be parliament. Yes. Is that what you're well, saying? Well, no, the executive has always got to run the country, but parliament should be putting into primary legislation a great deal of what is now going into regulation. Which is instead being done by yeah. the government. And of course, if you have primary legislation, there'll be amendments. There'll be a discussion on each clause of the bill. But if it's a regulation, basically, apart from select committees, and I served on one select committee where we were very unhappy with some of it, but we can't stop it. So it's a worry to our democratic process, that, isn't it? It is a reduction in the democracy of the country if the executive, and the most extreme was the prerogative problem. The last time... Are you talking about the, the case that the went case, well, to the Well, I'm Supreme talking Court. about Boris Johnson trying to do it. Suspend Parliament. Suspend Parliament because the last time that was done was Charles II. <laughs> and he did it when he didn't want money. Every time he wanted money, he got Parliament back. But then Louis XIV actually um, funded him for many years. So did... he didn't need Parliament. <laughs> well, the, the, the Supreme Court uh, had its view on that and, and ruled against him. Is that the right role for the judiciary? Should they then be asserting themselves in that way and saying, no, that's, that's not for the government to do. I find that very difficult question because I'm absolutely convinced that the decision, I have can't believe how Brenda Hale got 11 Supreme Court judges to agree. It's almost unheard of. Well, they've never been 11 before, but it's very difficult to get them all to agree. It's astonishing. Uh, particularly one or two of them who are friends of mine who disagree on principle. What, but, what do you think happened? How did she manage it? I don't know. A three-line three line whip? I did actually. Um, I think the seriousness of it. And the fact is that if Boris Johnson had been allowed to have that prerogative power, what um, Prime Minister in 50 years' time might have done? Would we end up? I, I was looking at the worst scenario, ending up with somebody like Hitler who actually not how he behaved, but how he treated his um, parliament. So and the judiciary had a key role there. They and, did. And, and has their role, would you say, become more enhanced since Brexit or even... Well, they became the enemies years, of the people, they, didn't they? <laughs> they became enemies of the people as far as the tabloid press was concerned. Yeah. But I'm not sure how far they should go. I think this was so important that I support the decision they made. I just hope they don't now think they're able to overrule Parliament in other matters. So looking uh, Overrule not Parliament, but the executive in other matters. Looking to the future, how do you see those, the, the power balance playing out between Parliament, the executive and the judiciary? How should it be? The judiciary should be applying the law. If there are gaps, as particularly in family law, the gaps have to be filled. If the executive of the day, supported by Parliament, think the judges have gone too far, they must change the law. So far as between Parliament and the executive, 
at the end of the day, the executive should be laying before Parliament the important things that they think should be passed. And Parliament should have the last say in whether or not what the executive wants to do should be carried on. So far as the Supreme Court's concerned, and I haven't really thought this through, but it seems to me that having had a landmark case, they should now be pretty restrained in following it to its ultimate. And a judge like Lord Reed, who's the new or current uh, president of the Supreme Court, is a Scot, a shrewd Scot, a lot more restrained perhaps than his predecessor. He will be aware of that. Oh, he'll be very much aware of it. And I think the Supreme Court would be very much aware of it. That I think, in my view, they made the right decision whether or not they should have gone so far. It was so important to make the right decision that but I hope they wouldn't try, try and do it again on something that might not be quite so important. Do you think there has been a decline among ministers in their respect for the rule of law and their respect for the democratic process? Absolutely, I think there has been. I'm more concerned about their respect for the democratic process, uh, which underpins everything, but I think their respect for the law. But I did read in the Times, I think, which is my main newspaper, uh, apart from the Financial Times, that um, one of the previous... Um, prime ministers or very senior ministers of many years ago, said he thought it was the poorest collection of ministers he'd seen <laughs> uh, in his lifetime who were currently ministers um, in this government. Well, the uh, I, 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 part one aspect of it has been the increasing politicisation, as some people see it, of the law officers. And of course, you've mentioned your brother held that position. Um, do you think that is the case? Yes, I do. And it's extremely interesting that we never know what Goldsmith, Lord Goldsmith, actually said by way of advice to government on when Iraq. he came back on Iraq when he came back from the States. No. And why not? Why wouldn't we know what the Attorney General's advice was? It, it? It's perfectly obvious he changed it. He did. Do you think he came under pressure from the government? I'm sure he came under pressure in the States and in England. I mean, and I, I understand, or I may be wrong, that Tony Blair was told by the president that, he did, that England didn't have to, well, the UK, didn't have to fight with the Americans. They wanted our moral support, but he was insisting on going in. I mean, I have to say I was opposed to the Iraq War, mm -hmm. which is what uh, colours my viewpoint on this. So, so, so subsequent holders of that office have, have not really had the independence of spirit that they should have. Independence from government. They've, they've regarded it as a political job, haven't they? Well, uh, I'm not sure. Um, I think, I mean, my brother was asked at one point to become a, a member of cabinet and he said he couldn't be a member of cabinet because his duty was to advise them. I'm not sure how far the um, attorney generals passed that. I don't think for a moment Dominic Grieve, who was an excellent attorney general, he certainly uh, would not have been politicized and he would have given independent advice that would not necessarily have been palatable. Certainly Mike told me some advice he gave to um, Margaret Thatcher wasn't palatable. <laughs> but I think others um, were not very strong characters. And of course the other terribly important person in the past was number three in the protocol of the country, the Queen, the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Lord Chancellor. He's now a second-rate you know... Um, politician. Politician. He's no longer in that position. And he would have had an extremely important influence as the elder statesman. So the weakening... And look at Hailsham as an example. And look at Derry Irving. I mean, I suspect one reason, I don't know, why Derry Irving got sacked was that um, Tony Blair didn't like his advice. He wasn't going to go along with some of those reforms, yes. I don't think. No, and that's why he was sacked. And then Tony Blair went public saying he was getting rid of the Lord Chancellor. He didn't realise the Lord <laughs> Chancellor apparently was Speaker of the House of Lords, uh, had, was mentioned and was referred to in 367 bills, Acts of Parliament, and he hadn't consulted the Queen. <laughs> <laughs> he, 
well, he had to row back on that in a big way, didn't he? It became impossible. So those, those, those two positions, Attorney General and Lord Chancellor, have been greatly weakened and diminished yes. over the years, yes. would you I say? I feel so. I'd like to see a robust Prime Minister who would recognise the importance of the Attorney General. I think the Lord Chancellor's passed it, basically. I don't think... But Keir Starmer, if he gets in, as he may well do, is at least a lawyer and a very good lawyer, and has a respect. And I would hope would appoint, uh, well, he's, I think his current one is, of course, the daughter-in-law of Ted Nugent uh, and the wife of a High Court judge. Yes, indeed. Uh, Emily, Th em Emily, Emily Thornberry. Uh, and I would have thought that she would have been brought up to recognise that the Attorney General should be independent. Well, we've got a we've got a woman Lord Chief Justice now, which I'm who thrilled. also from Absolutely from your true. school, I see. my school, Wickham Abbey. So, yeah. um, and she's a fellow bencher of the Inner Temple. Well, that, that's that's yeah. that's 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 good. I mean, is, is that going to change the public face of the judiciary? Uh, and if so, how? She's a people person. I don't know her extremely well, but I do know her. She's had a far broader experience of sitting as a judge than any other Lord Chief. Uh, she sat in, the, uh, in tribunals. She will, I'm sure, she's a very nice person, very open, very good at meeting people. I think that she will present a face of the judiciary uh, which is more open, more friendly, more um, anxious to make sure the public understand what goes on than previous Lord Chiefs have done. I think they have become increasingly able to um, put forward to the public, if they're interested, what, in fact, the judiciary are trying to do. But I think she'll be particularly successful. And I think, as a woman, that she'll be more interesting to a lot of the public. She'll bring her own aspect to it, won't yeah. she? And I think she's great. I just think it's... Oh, and the two outstanding candidates were both women. They were. Looking at the challenges that the judiciary face, the family courts in particular, maybe, what are they for the next 10 years? What are the challenges? To clear the backlog of cases, um, to um, make sure that the criminal bar in particular is sufficiently well paid to be doing the cases, to have sufficient judges, and for goodness sake, to repair the courts. <laughs> the courts of water pouring through, and some of them. The ma and I think probably open more magistrates' courts. They have closed so many magistrates' courts that people are ordinary people in rural areas are having to get several 20 miles to the local magistrates' court. Local justice is, is, has been greatly weakened. 95% of all cases are tried in the magistrates' court. And they have lost so many of their courts. I don't know what their delays are. We don't get told. But it's absolutely crucial that we have enough magistrates' courts. And the family courts? Yes, well, backlogs, funding, that's the thing. And um, more preventative work, not by the judges, but by the social workers, by the welfare officers, by the paediatricians in the hospitals, looking at where the problems are before they become so serious that the children have to be taken from their parents. This podcast was brought to you by the University of Law. Subscribe now to make sure you don't miss the next episode.